thank you for joining me today to discuss augmentative and alternative communication strategies and systems for people with ALS. My name is Elisa Brownlee. I'm an assistive technology practitioner with the ALS Association Greater Philadelphia Chapter, and I also work for the National Office. It's been my pleasure to serve people with ALS and their families for the past 24 years. And my specialty is communication. And I want to discuss with you different communication systems that people with ALS utilize during their journey with ALS. So there are several different alternative communication options. Now alternative communication is also known as AAC. So you might hear me use the acronym AAC. It is also referred to as SGD, speech generating devices. They're interchangeable. So AAC, SGD, they mean the same thing. So people that need some form of communication help have several options. We have rapid access, which is fast, efficient communication that doesn't plug into the wall. There's high tech traditional mainstream devices and then there's uh, insurance devices and I'm going to talk about all three of these strategies in today's presentation. So beginning with rapid access, the first priority, the absolute thing that you must do is establish a yes, no, and maybe system. This is really imperative because people that are unable to speak are often ignored. Imagine if you had to call first responders and they had to come into your house, but they don't know how your loved one communicates. So you establish a yes, no, maybe system and you write it down and you put it on the wall. John says yes, no, maybe, bye. That way anyone that enters your home has the most crucial communication system with your loved one. Are you in pain? Do you need assistance? And those answers needed to be answered by yes, no, and maybe. And once you establish a system, you put it on the wall, as I said, and then you write down how they do it. So a lot of people like to use blinks. I'm not a fan of blinks per se for people with ALS um, for several reasons. Sometimes people with ALS get a really lazy blink. So they'll blink and they'll kind of do that. And was that a yes? Was that a no? Sometimes I'm blinking and I miss their blink. I usually like to give targets. And then after a while, you don't need targets. You'll know that when they look to their right, that means yes. They look to their left, that means no. And they look to the ceiling, maybe. But you could stand at the foot of the bed or at the side of the bed, look this way for yes, look this way for no, look up for maybe. And so you've given them targets and then you know that you are making, um, you're receiving the information correctly. Yes, no, and maybe. You can also use letter boards and picture boards. This is an example of a picture board I have here. And these, um, you can customize these. Now these are pre-made, but you can customize them to whatever your loved one or the person with ALS you're working with needs, okay? Um, we have different kinds of boards. The national office and the chapter give out these boards for free. So all you need to do is email me. My email contact is on the first slide and my email contact is on the last slide. And I should have said that I will share this presentation with anybody. All you need to do is send me an email and ask for my slide. So I'm more than willing to do that. You can use boogie boards. Boogie boards are, um, uh, electronic LCD boards. For those of us old enough, we used to have boards that you would write on and you went Zip, and the writing would disappear. Well, these are the same thing. You write and then you press a button and it disappears. They're called boogie boards. They're available on Amazon. Or you can go to your local Walmart and or, 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 um, or Target and get um, wipe off boards, you know, just white boards and you use a marker and you erase it. Um, I gaze boards, which is, this is one of them. Um, use of laser pointers, um, which I will show you in a moment. And then there's a, an electronic device called a Megabee. It's an electronic um, letter board system. So here's just some examples of different rapid access technologies. This gentleman in the corner here um, is using a laser pointer, which is what this is. And the laser pointer 
is actually, it's called a safe laser. So it is safe to go into, you know, unfortunately if you aimed at someone's eyes, but you put it on the side of your glasses and then you can use it in conjunction with the letter board. So say this was on my, okay. You can use it on conjunction with the picture board. All right, a lot of people, what they do is they'll put this on and then across the room, they're going to have a poster board and then they can just write out or write out what they're saying. That poster board, 69 cents at, at Target, Walmart. You can put the alphabet on there. You can put frequently used phrases and sentences, um, words like glasses, hot, cold, etc. whatever they're using. Um, so you can purchase these laser pointers um, at a, uh, an online store called Low Tech Solutions, or you could make your own. What you can do is you can go to the dollar store or five below, you grab a laser pointer. Now, most of them have a little um, button that has to be ke uh, kept on. That's the difference, this one doesn't, um, but this one is also $130. If you go to your dollar store, your five below, you grab one that looks like this, okay? Um, and on the button, in order to keep it on, you just press a little piece of popsicle stick, a little stick, put some duct tape around it and turn it on and it's good to go. Now, of course, that one you don't want to aim in anyone's eyes. Um, that's a given, but it works and it can be a system that you put in place within a matter of minutes. And then you go and you buy the poster board at the dollar store and you have a communication system immediately. Um, this picture, this is the one I was talking about, the boogie board, that's an electronic LCD board. So, you know, you write or you draw and then you press a button at the top and it goes away. Um, the one in the corner here, this is called a critical communicator. And the nice thing about a critical communicator, it's a threefold. So, on this side, you have um, things like say oxygen and suction and IV line. Um, and in the middle, there's more pictures, but on the back, there's the alphabet. But the thing about the critical communicator is that it comes in 21 different languages. So this is the one that's in Arabic. And as you can see, um, for this one, the IV pole, not only does it say it in Arabic, it says it in English so that there's no communication breakdown if your um, person, your loved one, or the person you're caring with speaks a different language and you only speak English. So again, these come in 21 different languages. And then you could also make your own. You can use these, any of these, as a template to make your own and customize it for um, the, whatever that um, you need for your individual with ALS but you always, always wanna have a rapid access system. Even if you have the most expensive communication device out there, it can break, electronics can go, or like electricity can go down, or you're in an environment in which you can't, don't have access to your electronic devices. So in my 24 year career here, um, I've not yet seen anybody use a communication device when they're on the commode. So what are you going to do to communicate on the commode? You could use a picture board, a letter board, or you can even do something called encoding, which is what I recommend for the bathroom. Because there aren't that many things you wanna say on the bathroom when you're on the toilet. So you will come up with the, the five things that you need to say, for example. You know, number one is I need more time. Number two is I'm ready to get up. Number three is can you wipe me? You, again, put that on the wall. Put it on a piece of paper, number one equals, number two equals, number three equals. Now, most people realize that when you're on a toilet or a commode, you're mostly folded in, okay? But if my caregiver says, do I have, do you need to say something to me? Uh, one, two, three, uh, okay, you're ready to be wiped. Good enough. We've got that communication system established. Because what I've heard from our families is our biggest challenges for communication are in the bathroom and the bedroom. So have a rapid access system for both of those places so there's no communication breakdown because when there is communication breakdown, um, a lot of times that leads to anger. Um, and anger is the most uh, difficult emotion to deal with. Um, when somebody with ALS gets upset and they're angry and they do have some speech, the more emotional you are, 
the worse your speech is going to get. And so it's a vicious cycle. The caregiver keeps saying, what, what? The person with ALS gets more upset, the speech gets worse, and then communication totally breaks down. So in order to avoid that, grab something. Grab a letter board. If they can still write, grab a piece of paper. Grab that whiteboard in order to alleviate um, the communication breakdown. Okay, these are really important also when it terms of rapid access for emergency preparedness. In today's environment with COVID-19 in our hospitals, most hospitals do have a policy that there are no visitors allowed in the emergency room for an inpatient hospitalization um, if your loved one is emergently vented. Um, so you are not allowed, you as a caregiver are not allowed to be in the hospital or in the emergency room with your loved one. So they are on their own. How are they going to communicate with the hospital staff? That's where these things come in so important, okay? Um, there are way that that and the yes, no, maybe system is the way that the hospital can know how to communicate with your loved one. We also use these letter boards um, for other emergency preparedness as in terms of mandatory evacuation or if you're in a shelter. So teaching these strategies, these rapid access technologies can really save somebody's life. I don't say that to be over dramatic. I say that, that in, in our healthcare system right now, our first responders are overwhelmed, our hospitals are overwhelmed. And so the most basic communication of yes, no, maybe is crucial in order for a person with ALS to let the healthcare workers know their wants and their medical needs. So you guys, some people say, okay, you, you've expressed interest in, in a communication device. So these are things to consider. Um, who's asking? I get a lot of calls from caregivers saying, I want a communication device for my loved one. So my first call, my first answer question is, you know, have you talked to them about it? Well, no, I just know they're going to use it. Well, I'll be honest, no, that's not true. They have to want to use it. They have to understand what you're asking them to do. Um, they have to have a comfort level with some technology. If we're talking something that plugs into the wall. Over my career, I've had people tell me, absolutely not, nothing that plugs in the wall. Okay, then we're going to use these. And that's fine with me, as long as you have some form of communication system. That's the most important thing. I know we live in a world of devices that plug into the wall. But some people are just simply not comfortable with that. And we have to take into consideration what they want. A lot of grandchildren say to their grandparents who might have ALS, you got to get a smartphone. That person, that end user has never used technology. They don't know what a computer is. It's gonna be terrifying for them. So we have to meet people where they are. And if where they are is saying, I just wanna write, okay, then you as a family need to respect that. Me as a clinician needs to respect that. And I do. But other things to, that we have to take into consideration are any cognitive changes, any language changes, um, physical and positioning issues, okay, that is crucial. When I think back um, to the first person that I worked with, his name was Paul, and I remember exactly where he lived, and he wanted to write a memoir because he had been a Holocaust survivor, and he wanted to write his, um, his experiences down, and I was all on board with that. Except when I went to Paul's home, and I'm going to demonstrate, he was in his wheelchair like this. Okay, and he had been sitting like that for months on end. And as much as technology can help, it is nearly impossible to get somebody in a 90 degree position um, to be able to use a computer. So positioning, we had to get him upright first and get his head upright and get the wheelchair supports so that he could remain upright 
and then he could operate a computer. So positioning is crucial. Um, you have a lot of people with ALS that get a weak neck, okay? And so they'll be like this. Well, okay, but I, you could use a computer in this situation, but I'd rather get you upright if we can for optimal use of any type of communication system. And so there are caregiving issues um, with electronic devices. Some of the more sophisticated ones do require the caregiver set it up. So the caregiver has to be willing to use it. Um, with insurance funded devices, there are, of course, co-pays that might be um, due um, if you order an, a device through insurance. Um, living issues, where is the person living? Are they living in assisted living? Are they living in um, a nursing home? And is a nursing home willing to set up a device for somebody every day? Don't assume that they are. You have to ask. Um, and also that only certain, and I said SGD, speech generating devices and or AAC devices are fundable by insurance. Every insurance company will follow Medicare guidelines and Medicare has mandated that they will only pay for devices they deem medically necessary. An iPad that you go buy at Best Buy is not a medical necessity with them. Okay, you have to go through special companies in order to get a device that insurance will fund. Okay, and so they're coded and that, um, that they can be funded from both Medicare and private insurance. So these are just some examples of some insurance funded devices that are out there. Um, you can get a, a device um, that is like a tablet, like this one. And as your disease progresses, uh, access issues, like if you could no longer use your hands, we can add additional access issues onto an existing tablet-like device here already. So you might get a device when you can first use your hands, and then as your disease progresses, we can modify that device through your insurance um, so that you can continue to access it. So just speaking a little bit about funding, as I just mentioned about Medicare. Um, Medicare will pay for what devices they have deemed medically appropriate. Um, it is covered under Part B. Now, Part B is a buy-in. When people sign up for Medicare, they get A, but you have to have Part B, which covers called, something called durable medical equipment. And that's um, the, the division that these communication devices fall into under Durable medical equipment, which is also called DME. So Medicare will pay 80% of the allowable of the cost of any of these devices. Now, these devices, the most sophisticated devices like this, eye gaze here and here and here, um, they, they average around $15,000. So if Medicare is only paying 80% of the allowable, that means that either the individual with ALS is responsible for the 20% or they're hopefully they have secondary or supplemental insurance which will fund the remaining 20%. If you don't have secondary insurance, the client is responsible for 20%. And some people have opted to go into managed Medicare um, and their usual durable medical equipment benefit is 80%. So there is usually always a 20% copay if you have managed Medicare. In Medicaid, every state has different coverage. Uh, private insurance, it depends on what's called the client rider. So even you could have two people that have Keystone Blue Cross in the same room with sitting on the same sofa and they might have um, different riders. They do have different riders because your company has negotiated different coverage even though you're covered under Keystone Blue Cross. So uh, a rider is basically how much of the insurance is going to fund for a particular procedure or device. So when it comes to AAC devices and you have private insurance, you need to call your insurance 
and say, what is my durable medical equipment coverage? I've had an answer of zero for some folks who have no durable medical equipment coverage. I've had 50%, um, usually the average is 80%. I've rarely had 100%, but sometimes it happens for, or for AAC devices. Um, so you have to call and ask what your durable medical equipment coverage is. And then the Veterans Administration, depends on what category the client is in, but all our clients with ALS should be category one, which means that they would get it automatically. Category one is the highest category in the Veterans Administration, and vets that are category one get almost all devices that they ever ask for. And I mentioned this a little earlier, AAC is not funded when a, a client is living in a nursing home or when they are enrolled in hospice. This is a medical mandate. So for clients in nursing homes, check your state's Medicaid coverage. In Pennsylvania, we are now fortunate that if you are part of a Pennsylvania managed Medicaid, it has to be managed Medicaid, um, it is covered for a communication device if you live in a skilled facility. If the client has private insurance, it may be covered. You need to call and ask. If um, for both of these scenarios in, um, in a nursing home or on hospice, there are loaner devices either through the state's ALS chapter or through an organization called Team Gleason. Team Gleason is a nonprofit uh, charity that is out of New Orleans that loans communication devices at no charge to any client that has been diagnosed with ALS. Now, of course, they do have guidelines in terms of their loaners, so you would need to get on their website, which is teamgleason.org, and check out um, their page about communication devices. I don't want to spend too much time on this, but just know that if you want to go through insurance, there are protocols. Um, you just can't call your doctor and say, I want a communication device. That's not the way it happens. Medicare guidelines, and again, every insurance follows Medicare procedures, that um, the Medicare guidelines dictate that you have to get an AAC assessment by an appropriately credentialed and trained speech language pathologist. The acronym for that is SLP. Um, oftentimes, these AAC evaluations are done um, with a variety of different disciplines. Um, you might have an occupational therapist or a physical therapist involved or a rehab engineer or an assistive technologist like myself. Because this is um, a, I don't, I don't want to say complicated, but it is an arduous <laughs> report for the speech language pathologist to write um, because they have to do a comprehensive evaluation of the client in terms of their physical ability, their cognitive ability, their vision, their hearing. They have to look at positioning. They have to give a whole detailed background on a medical history. Um, they have to document um, that there is a communication um, impairment and that the client cannot meet their current communication needs verbally. Um, and then they have to document what they have tried uh, with the client, what kind of devices they tried, uh, whether or not the client was successful. How was the client accessing the device? Um, so it is a comprehensive report. And as I mentioned, oftentimes you have to pull in different disciplines um, in order to um, document all of the Medicare criteria. So once that process is done, that what's called the AAC evaluation, the evaluation is sent to the prescribing doctor. Um, there does have to be a, a, a note in the client's chart from the doctor that AAC is needed, and this is called a face-to-face -face evaluation. The doctor signs off on the evaluation. Um, that evaluation must include a prescription. 
uh, the speech language pathologist sends all the paperwork to the vendor of the communication device. The vendor then bills insurance. And once approved, the device is usually shipped directly to the client. Oftentimes from start to finish, this process can take about two months. Worst case scenario, three months. Best case scenario, one month. It depends on the, uh, the, the initial referral to the speech language pathologist, how soon that person can see the client. And in this in age of COVID, um, some healthcare professionals are not going into homes and some hospitals have stopped doing AAC evals because they're an outpatient procedure and they don't want to bring people in. So even getting an evaluation could be difficult. We are trying to get AAC evaluations covered under tele-rehab, still working on that. Um, and so just getting the evaluation may be problematic right now. So allow enough time from start to finish. Don't assume that just because you have the need, oh, I need it now, then I'm gonna get it tomorrow. It, through insurance, it does not happen that way. So for people with ALS, insurance will only pay for current needs, not future needs. And this is important because, and I'm sorry, this got a little messed up here when I trans transferred my slides. Um, this picture should be over here. Um, but as I mentioned, you might get a tablet or some other type of device initially. And as the disease progresses, we need to change that access method because you're having difficulty with your hands. But we can't get you what's like an eye gaze system, which is what this is right here. I can't get it if you still have hand function because insurance only pays for current needs, not future needs. And I, I understand as frustrating as that is, because people with ALS and their families want to be proactive. I totally get that. And I wish we could be, but we cannot be because that's not the way our insurance system is set up right now. So we get them what they need at the time and then we add on. So if your hands start to become difficult, we can add on what's called a head mouse or an eye gaze. And I'll talk about both later. Both of these can be added on when clinically justified. And that clinical justification for adding a head mouse or an eye gaze is when the client can no longer access with their hands. I see a lot of the majority of people with ALS that opt to wait until they need an eye gaze system before they go through insurance. So they'll use an iPad, their iPhone, um, until the time comes that they can't, and then we go through insurance. Um, and as I mentioned, eye gaze devices are not funded unless the SLP can document that there are no other access methods. That's a Medicare criteria. So the thing about insurance mounts, insurance will only fund one mount, all right? So when the speech language pathologist does the report, they'll talk about mounting to the family. And so mounts can either be added, if you can look at this picture here, on a wheelchair where they're fixed onto the side of a wheelchair, okay? Or this is a rolling mount. This is actually a lot larger than it looks, but it's on wheels. And it can be moved from the kitchen to the bedroom, to the dining room. Um, and you can obviously roll it um, to somebody in a wheelchair. But what you can't do then is take it outside if the person is on the wheelchair and they wanna go outside, unless you wanna roll the mount behind them, the rolling mount. So sometimes people will say, well, I want, I want to remain mobile. I wanna go out into the community with my communication device, so I wanna put it on my wheelchair. Then sometimes as the disease progresses, they're spending more time in bed and now they've lost access to their communication device because it, the only mount that insurance paid for was on the wheelchair. And then people will say to me, well, instead of that, I got the rolling mount, but that mount doesn't fit into a car or into a, a van. So people will come to clinic and I'll say to them, where is your communication device? And I say, well, we only have a rolling mount, it's at home. So there 
are multi-purpose mounts that are starting to be covered under insurance. It is important to tell the therapist that you're working that you want them to try to get a multi-purpose mount, which means um, down here and on the right, um, this is a clamp and that clamp is on the side of the wheelchair and then you can buy a separate clamp that can go onto the side of a, a hospital bed table or that can clamp onto the side of a hospital bed. So then you just take the mount, you lift it out and you put it into the other clamp, okay? This one is uh, by a company called Blue Skies Designs and it's, a, it's called a mount and mover, M-O-U-N-T hyphen N hyphen mover. But I was recently at a professional um, trade show and we were told that some insurances will pay for multi-mounts. The issue that I find is that speech language pathologists don't know about it. So you as a family or you as a person with ALS need to advocate to get a multi-purpose mount so that you're not calling organizations and saying, well, I need a rolling mount. Well, we don't have, I don't have rolling mounts right now. Um, I don't know if Team Gleason just loans out mounts. I, I don't know. And so this is a problem for our folks is that they get this one mount and then they're kind of stuck. So we don't want that to happen. Again, talk to your therapist about a multi-mount. So talking about um, non-insurance funded devices. So for people that either don't want to go through their insurance, maybe they don't have insurance. Um, maybe they're living in a nursing home, as I mentioned, where there's no coverage. They're in the rolled in hospice. They can't, at, during this COVID epidemic, um, get access to a speech language pathologist. Um, what can we do for those folks? And there's a lot you can do, that you can buy a device and have it be used as a communication device within a half hour or so. So you can use your iPhone, your iPad, your Android tablet, your Android phone. So iPad communication apps. You don't need to spend a lot of money on a good app, okay? I love Speech Assistant for $14.99. I think it's a great one. Um, there's CoWriter, which is what I'm gonna bring up for you right now. All these apps allow you, whoops, I'm sorry, to save frequently used phrases and sentences, um, to create a whole speech before you give it, um, to create questions for your doctor that you can give over a telehealth visit, okay? They um, have male and female voices. Most of the voices coming out of them are really good. Um, the more expensive ones can, can obviously do different things. But if you just want a text to talk device, or excuse me, app, you can get one for as little as $14.99. So on my co-writer here, I have, um, gotta turn my sound on, and I'm gonna turn up my ringer, and it's gonna say, Hello, please be patient as I am using my phone to communicate with you. I did that earlier today, and so now that is going to be part of my saved messages, okay, so that I can bring it up at any time. You can also use these devices to activate your smart speakers, okay? So you can have, story. whoops, um, you can have, can more clean? Whoops. No, no, no. sorry, um, I have, I have set off my my Alexa, Alexa stop. So, Alexa stop. Trying to lift it up so you can see it without activating it. Sorry, it's a little hard one-handed, but Alexa, what is the news? Here's your news. Alexa, stop. In NPR news. Alexa, NPR. stop. So I activated my Alexa through my communication device. So smart speakers will respond even if it's a different voice coming out. As long as you give them the verbal commands, they don't care if it's coming out of your phone 
or if it's coming out of your iPad or, or your Android. So this is a, an app that I really like. It's called Flip Writer. And basically, this is nice if you're ever out to eat again, <laughs> um, or if you're, you know, in a, uh, a, a, in a, a coffee shop, or if you just want to have a private conversation, the user types here and the, and the person across the room or across the table from them can see what they're typing. So when it comes to accessing the iPad, you can use your fingers, you can use a stylus. Um, there are many, many different stylus out there. We don't often see people with using mouth or head stylus, but I do have some people who ask what do they look like, and that's what they look like. But you can, a variety of different stylists, and if you are having problems with accessing, and if you go to an ALS clinic, you can always ask your occupational therapist for some recommendations, and she or he could give you that. So also built into iOS is switch access, and it allows hands-free use of the iPad. Um, and the only thing that you need are, are two things. You need um, a, an interface, which is pictured here down at the bottom, and that one's by RJ Cooper, and then you need a switch. This is a switch, just like pictured here, and here, you can hear it. A switch is um, a piece of equipment like this that sends a current to the machine to do something. The best example I can give you is a power wheelchair. So when somebody is driving a power wheelchair in, with a joystick and they move that joystick front, back, left, right, it is sending a current to the machine to do something. So going forward, the machine goes forward. That's a switch. So it's the exact same thing here. But when I hit this, it's sending a current to the, the iPad or a communication device to do something. So this is an, a pillow switch. This is the one up here, okay? But you can put switches anywhere on the body. There's muscle movement. So up here, and as long as you hear that, you know that the person is activating it, all right? You put switches under here, hundreds of different switches based on the client's muscle movement. But with with ALS, uh, switches are often dynamic. So I can, somebody can start using a switch in their hand and then their hands might become more difficult. So then we put it near their head or they'll put it near a chin, okay? But what a switch does is once you hit this, and this is actually plugged into that black box you see down at the bottom, which is Bluetooth, it sends a current to the iPad to start scanning. It goes row, row, row. I hit my switch, then it goes column, column, column. I hit my switch and it opens notes for me here. And then I type away. I get the on-screen keyboard, comes to the letter that I want. I hit my switch and it types my letter for me. So the ability to have switch access is already built in to the iOS software, but you do need these two external things, which is the switch, uh, the Bluetooth switch adapter and then any type of switch. That's why you would need to work with a professional whether or not it's physically or through telehealth to determine what site a, a therapist would say, okay, use a switch on there or use a switch by their left side of the head or you know, by their foot. So a lot of apps now coming out for the iPad front-facing camera access. All right, you need an iPhone 10 or above or an iPad Pro. You need the camera in front of the iPad, okay? Um, and so the, the idea behind that is that, um, so this is called I Have a Voice, all right? And the idea is that I'm moving around. Okay, I hope, I don't know if you could see that, but I'm moving the that around by moving my eyes, okay? And so it is a really limiting um, app in terms of it, it doesn't have a lot of function, feature, oh, sorry, a lot of features. You know, it has yes, no, I'm hungry, I'm pain. But there are others that are out there. Um, one of them is called Hawkeye. And Hawkeye allows you 
to have greater access. It doesn't allow you to have full access to the device yet, um, but they're coming, okay? Um, but as long as you have the front facing camera on the iPhone, you can use these apps. There is now a product called Skyle, um, and it allows you to have full eye gaze access to an iPad Pro, all right? Um, it's expensive right now. It just came out in January, so you know the price will come down, but it is $3,000. Can be cheaper than a copay if you only have 50% coverage for a $15,000 device. And as I mentioned, it gives you full eye gaze control of your iPad Pro. Comes with a protective um, case and a built-in mounting plate for wheelchair users. So these are mounts that you can buy um, for your iPad or your Android device. And you can get them on Amazon. I have one here, all right? This, is, this comes in um, a variety of different sizes. This is like a 30 foot, 30, sorry, 30 inch, um, but you can get them as small as 15 inches. But the idea behind this is that you clamp it on a wheelchair, you maneuver the gooseneck, and then you position the iPad or the iPhone right in front of the user, okay? Comes here, you, this is for an iPad, and you would then do this, put the iPad in and it's secure. It also has a plate that you can take off if you're not using an iPad, you can put this on for an iPhone or an Android phone. I shouldn't just say the eyes. Um, but these are available on Amazon. I think this one was $35. Um, you can also get ones that just stand if you want. This is just a stander. Again, you put your device in here and um, you can actually move it this way or you can move it this way. And this one stands this is again on Amazon. But the nice thing about these device, uh, these um, mounts is most of them come with a clamp at the bottom. So again, when I go back to moving it from one device to the other, you can move this from your wheelchair and then put it onto the side of a hospital bed like here or onto the side of an over the bed hospital table or onto the side of your coffee table, whatever. So that's why they're really nice is that they're movable depending on what environment you're using them in. So speaking a little bit about Androids, I've been talking about the eye devices, but there are lots of Android devices um, and lots of Android apps for both tablets and for um, uh, for Android uh, devices themselves. So this is my Android phone. This is the, the app I, I told you I like. It's called Speech Assist. You can see these are all pre-programmed. I hope you can see that. Uh, phrases and sentences. Um, this one says- I cannot speak. I am fine, thank you. Good afternoon. Good evening. And up here are different categories. It says phrases, food and drink, verbs, body, feelings. And you can customize all of this, okay? So you could say, I'm calling 911. I have an emergency. My phone number is. And plug it in, okay? Um, the, the speech assist can be used on the Android phone, again, or on the tablet. And then the Android gives you a little more leeway in terms of access. Um, the iProducts, the iPad especially, besides that Skyle there's, and, and the Switch, there, there's no other external um, method of access besides hands. The Android um, can because all the external things that you see here require a USB port and that's the one thing that the iPad does not have. That, that is deliberate from Apple. They want to keep it that way. Um, but the Android tablets do offer more access, and I'm going to talk about that in a moment. But we do also have people using full-size laptops. People are comfortable with that, and that's okay. You can even get laptops now that are dual function, that function as a laptop, and then the, the lid folds over, and it acts as a tablet. 
but you can utilize these with both your hands and eye gaze access again and head mouse access. And that's what we're gonna talk about next. So a head mouse replaces the standard computer mouse for people who cannot use their hands. Um, and it translates the natural movement of the user's head into movement to move the mouse around, okay? Works just like a computer mouse, um, but you're using your head instead. So here it is, this is a head mouse. This is a receiver that is obviously on the top of a laptop. It can also go on the top of an Android tablet. And so this receiver um, works in conjunction with my head movement. The user wears a dot, a reflective dot, either on uh, their skin or on the bridge of their glasses. And that reflective dot is picked up by the camera and the head mouse. And as I'm moving around the screen, I'm moving the mouse and at the bottom you can see here an on-screen keyboard similar to what you get on any smartphone or any tablet and what I do is I move my head around and I find the letter that I want and I dwell on that letter and after a certain time which I set the computer or the tablet types that letter and then I move on A N D space so in order to utilize a head mouse, you have to be able to get the mouse on all four quadrants of your screen. It does take um, neck strength. And for some of our folks with ALS, it can get fatiguing. So that's why the therapist would look at, is that an option or is it not an option? Because you're just saying it's so tiring for me. Okay, so then we, we go to a different access method. So eye gaze, um, I've mentioned eye gaze before. It turns any um, device, uh, whether or not it's a laptop or a desktop or a tablet into an eye gaze device, okay? Um, which if I'm gonna go back here, that's the eye gaze. This is an Android tablet here with the eye gaze bar below here. So it turns any type of tablet, laptop, desktop, if that's what you're comfortable with, into an eye gaze device. So it uh, you can um, purchase this. This is through Toby. There's another one called iTech Digital here. You can add it onto your own device. Um, and you plug it into the USB port, you download the software, and now you've turned any device that you could buy at Best Buy into an eye gaze device. Utilizing text-to-speech software for computers. If you're comfortable using a laptop, there's free software. Chip Speaking is the one that I recommend. Oh, I'm sorry, e Twiliquist is the one that I always recommend. Chip, chip Speaking is has been around for years too, um, and they're both good. Uh, they're both free, and I love free. So here's an example of e Twiliquist. Okay, it allows you to save. Uh, frequently used phrases and sentences. It has what's called quick fire. So when I type F1 or F2, it'll F1, it'll say, how are you? Hello, how are you? F2, it'll say, thank you. Um, and so this is free. Now, also, Windows 10 has an eye gaze software pre-installed. As long as you are running the current vision of Windows version of Windows 10, you have the eye gaze software already in it. it. Doesn't cost you anything. In order to utilize that, you need what's called a Toby 4C game bar. Um, that is only $149 on Amazon. Um, so you can turn your Windows computer into an eye gaze system for $150. Now, this bar is not as precise as the one that costs $2,000 but it is a good way, first of all, to figure out if you even like using eye gaze um, for $150, it's a lot cheaper. Um, and if you are on a budget, it does work. It's just not as precise as the $2,000 one, but it is an option for people and um, it can be a game changer if you don't have the financial means or if you don't have insurance. So you could still get access to eye gaze um, using a Windows 10 computer. So this is my last slide about what does the future hold? Um, 
because a lot of people ask me that. Um, brain computer interfaces, maybe, uh, is under a lot of research uh, for both invasive and non invasive. And the idea is to harness your brainwave technology to utilize a computer. Um, it does work. We've had people use it, but it is still in research only. So you will see the non invasive, it's like a skull cap with all these electrodes coming out. And then there's an invasive one where there are, is a sensor placed in the brain. This is deep brain surgery. And then there's a, a small bolt that comes out of the, the skull and uh, that these receivers are then pressed on that bolt, pressed, screwed in. Um, and the idea is you harness your brain waves to either um, use communication software or in the terms of these two ladies at the bottom, uh, they actually are driving robotic arms um, with their brain waves to feed them. And I chose these two pictures because they're from a, a video that is available on YouTube from a company called BrainGate. But uh, I loved these two women. First of all, uh, neither of them had been able to feed themselves for years. And the woman on the left here uh, used her brain waves to feed herself chocolate. And then the woman on the right said she always wanted to sip her own coffee. So two of my favorite things, chocolate and coffee. So I had to grab these two pictures of these inc two incredible women using brain waves to operate robotic arms to deliver food and drink to themselves. And lastly, sorry, this, I thought it was my last slide, but I've had a lot of people say to me, why don't people use communication devices? Well, there's a variety of reasons, and I'm going to circle back to one of the things I first said in the beginning is that families don't involve the end user. You know, they'll just make assumptions. Oh, they'll use this or I'll make them use that. I've had other people say to me, well, if I use that communication device or that app, you know, I'm giving in to the disease. And I always say, I'm sure you are. By not communicating with me, you did let ILS win, didn't you? You know, it's not giving in to the disease to use assistive technology. It's to make your life better, to enhance your quality of life, and then sometimes to keep you safe or to keep you alive in, in, in a hospital during COVID right now so that people know how to communicate with you. Um, a lot of people have said to me, I don't need it, I sound fine. They don't seem to hear that they do have a speech problem. Um, so if your loved ones are saying to you, you know, your speech is really um, being difficult to understand, they're not saying that because they're being mean, they're saying that because they love you and they desperately want to understand you. So they want you to be able to communicate and they're encouraging you to use some other form of communication system besides verbally. Um, and people have said to me, you're supposed to understand me um, as my wife or my husband. That's not necessarily true. <laughs> they're making every effort. Um, and sometimes there's a lot of fear and anger about the loss of communication, which I totally understand. Um, and then people are resistant to technology. So know that using a, a different form of communication besides verbally is a process. It is not something that happens overnight. Again, I say to my, my people with ALS, when people say they don't understand you, it's not because they're trying to be difficult. They are desperate to understand you. Um, they just didn't. Um, and so using another form, typing it out, writing it out, can, can alleviate those communication breakdowns and it can alleviate the anger that you might feel that goes along with it. But people value what you're saying. They just need you to use another form in which to say it. And as I mentioned, you know, there, this is a process. There are some psychological issues of, of using assistive technology and, and therapists. Don't be despondent if a person with ALS opts not to use your suggestions. Um, know that they're, they're in a process. It's, it's similar to um, the bereavement process, when somebody loses the ability to speak, they're grieving um, what they always had, the loss of their verbal communication. So they're going through the acceptance and the denial and the grief and the bargaining. Um, it's a process. 
So some of the resources, the National ALS Association has great resources, um, but I would hope you would also utilize me. That's why I'm here. That's why I'm employed by the chapter to help you to understand what your options are. And um, I'm happy to take your emails. You can also connect with me on Twitter. Um, I also have a ALS Facebook page, a Elisa Bradley ALS, that um, I post information about communication and assistive technology for people with ALS. And I wanna thank you for your time today in joining me about your communication options for people with ALS. I'll talk to you soon.